thank you for very much for inviting me and to this incredible idea of a conference. Um, is we hold medenyet nam bailare per opus percenti this badi is we hold we hold lamu rahmatish kirak anyway i'm going to tell you a little story um i normally lead a very boring life i do linguistics write grammars of things. It's very, very dull. Um, this is a free Weaver textbook. Um, I also look at Weaver discourse, and yesterday people were talking about the discourse of terrorism and state and local actors, and what we were partly talking about, of course, was the control of the conversation. And you might be interested that a study I did about 10 years ago uh, looked at how Chinese media used Chinese and English terms and changed them after 2011. So that, um, bef uh, excuse me, before 2001. So, the term Uyghur separatist was in, in Chinese was very frequent before 2001. After 2001, the, uh, the term Uyghur separatist and its Chinese equivalent, was not very common. And in, in, instead, the term Uyghur terrorist became common. And you can see in these graphs how they increased over time. Um, the numbers are there, but it's less. Um, salient in a quick presentation. Just wanted to put that out there. But anyway, my boring scholarly life, Urumqi, Bishkek, Lawrence, Kansas, you know, ordinary life, and then suddenly out of the blue, I had a really, really exotic experience in a really exotic location inside the Beltway. Because there, I, I got curious about an organization uh, called the Radio Free Asia Uyghur Service. And there, there were 11 people broadcasting since 1998, so for 15 years in Uyghur language. And what I noticed is they had a whiteboard in their office and they were collectively proposing terms to replace Chinese language terms. So, for example, taking the term Zongtong, president, and replacing it by president, and things like this. And this was a collaborative effort, one of consensus. And I thought, this is really interesting. This is language change. It's, this is language engineering. These people are not language planners, but in fact, that's what they're doing. There are only 11 of them at that time, but they had an outsized influence and continue to have an outsized influence because they reach millions of listeners. So I thought, well, this, uh, this is worthy of some sort of ethnographic, ethnolinguistic study. And I started to think, well, what, what about other broadcasters in the CIS and in China? So, what I did with my colleagues, two of whom are here, is we developed a corpus of radio broadcasts in Urumqi, Beijing, and the exotic location, Washington, D.C., <laughs> and took samples from one day a month for an entire six-month period from each place. So, same day, same news, different places. And um, so what, we're, what I'm talking about here today are three um, potential varieties of Uyghur. Russosphere Uyghur, that is the Uyghur influenced by Russian spoken in the CIS. Sinosphere Uyghur, 
spoken uh, China, the Uyghur spoken in China, and what I'm calling diasporic Uyghur, with Washington D.C. as the exemplar, but by no means limited to Washington D.C. So we take Australian Uyghur, German Uyghur, etc., as examples as well. I'm looking at this through three linguistic, sociolinguistic lenses. The first is familiar to all of you: sinicization, that is the assimilation to Chinese language and culture of the language. The second is diglossia, that is the use of two varieties of the same language at the same time. I'll talk about that a bit later. And the third is language purism. So the idea that there is one true Uyghur language. It is beautiful, it sparkles, it is untouched by other things. Okay. Where is Uyghur now as a language? We have at least 11 million speakers, we have a rich cultural heritage, it is the lingua franca for an area that is one-sixth of China's landmass. It's spoken in many other countries. There's a lot of Uyghur scholarship. By the way, I find it interesting that all of the policy people are not here today, as if language and culture has nothing to do with policy, once again. Um, but there, nonetheless, there's a lot of Uyghur scholarship, and more people have heard of the Uyghurs. They're salient in the West, okay? But is Uyghur also under threat? I think we can agree. Language contact has led to switching between Uyghur and Russian, Uyghur and Chinese, and language mingling, which we will hear in the next presentation. Uyghur linguistic territory is being encroached. Uyghur is no longer, longer the language of instruction in schools. Uyghur is in media, but media is increasingly in these other dominant languages. And job access, as we all know, is not through Uyghur. So this is all sinicization. Let's take some really concrete examples. On a radio call-in show, the, the Uyghur broadcast, in the in Uyghur language, the Uyghur broadcaster answers a call-in and he says, Wei? And the person says, Why, man, on so a mess? <laughs> hey, I'm not Chinese. Okay. Second, second show, the broadcaster says, um, says to the callers, You call this number, okay? <clears throat> Telephone number eight. R ba san chi, R liu chi, and the interview. Wei ruqie ban lan san liu man says, okay, can't you count in Uyghur? What's your problem? All right, and hangs up on him. These these issues led um, the researcher Ashley Thompson in 2003 to to um, hear from Uyghurs in. Chinese Turkestan, that Uyghur has become kalamakan. It's messy, it's disorderly. <clears throat> uh, in her study, what she found, having people look at television broadcasts and comment on them, is, she, and, is that people on their own have developed a conscious attempt to do something to make the language more orderly. Okay? And this means maybe thinking about some of the Chinese words, maybe thinking about not mixing so much to avoid the Chinese. Um, I saw Ashley briefly yesterday, but I don't think she's here today. Um, okay, so what I'm talking about here through the medium of uh, looking at radio broadcasts is that uh, a new kind of Uyghur is emerging. Um, and this is contrasting a sinicized Uyghur, that is a Chinese inflected Uyghur, and the same can be said for Russian inflected Uyghur, I'm not talking about that today. Um, on the one hand, and a de Uyghur on the other, so this is a Uyghur that has been purified of Chinese. These, this second variety is emerging, interestingly enough, not just in Washington DC, but also elsewhere. And this is, from a sociolinguistic point of view, very interesting because usually when there are two varieties, one is clearly very high prestige, people like it, it seems educated and, you know, cool and everything, and then there's a low prestige kind that is 
really not popular, but it may be used a lot. But in this case, it's really not clear what is high prestige and what is low prestige because people um, make negative remarks about both for different reasons. What am I talking about exactly? Let's hope that this works. Um, and again, I'm limiting my remarks to uh, a comparison of Uyghur spoken in China and Uyghur here, so I'm excluding the third bubble there, CIS Uyghur. But, um, so we can hear something like this. <laughs> Yerjigin ministerlik hech kimga tinch operatdan yigirim sakkizinchi operatgacha Chongchengda g'arbi janob g'arbi shimolning ochiq mas'ulotini oshirish qilibda o'tkan bo'jim qilish siniqi So where was that from any guesses? Let's try one more. Let's try one more. Reading magazine millatda umr sinada xitoy o'quvchilar bir uyg'ur o'quvchiga to'plash bo'jim qilib uni yerga yarlamoqda Vatanning moral bishira to'qilishi berib bir kunda ikki yuz berishga diqqatni chekmaydi. Uyg'ur. Okay. Guess is now. Okay, well the first one was Beijing, Chinese National Radio, second one was Washington Post. Um and what happens is of course when there's a call-in situation, then you you hear the two varieties bumping up against each other. So this is an R, the next is an RFA broadcast where you hear um, the RFA broadcaster followed by somebody in Chinese Turkestan calling in. Okay, little sample, but you get the picture. Um, so what we're seeing is this state of two varieties coexisting. Um, and this is accompanied by a great deal of ideological thought. We all have ideology, it's okay. I have ideology, you have ideology. So in, within China, the, the dominant ideology is assimilation. Part of the great Chinese nation, the language, culture, all have to assimilate. In the CIS, Uyghur is very Russian-facing, so you get a lot of mixing with Russian, that's pretty logical. But in the diaspora community, uh, the, the, the <coughs> discourse is one of purism, so being autonomous is associated with language purity. But the question that I'm asking here is what counts as pure Uyghur? Um, we'll see that it's it's very hard to have in indeed okay i give away the store impossible to have a pure language so what does pure Uyghur mean in this case again the three broadcasters radio for asia chinese national radio in beijing and urumqi uh, radio uh, chinese national radio probably emerged as a reaction partial uh, the Uyghur service thereof probably emerged as a reaction to Radio Free Asia's success. Um, we can also spend lots upon the semiotics of the websites. I would say in decreasing orders of seriousness, here is RFA's website, here is Chinese National Radio's Uyghur Service website, and here is Xinjiang uh, Radio's website. And you have to really go down way below Mr. Bean to get to anything about broadcast. Um, <clears throat> to summary, uh, when we look at what, what uh, after analyzing these 30 different broadcasts, when we look at the vocabulary, as we might ex expect, geographical terms entail an entire knowledge hierarchy, an ontology of knowledge. And so this is one of the key places where language purism occurs. So any Chinese terms for geograph geographical places um, are almost the first to be cleansed. So um, when we have personal titles, like you never hear Zhongguo, instead you hear, let's see if this will work. Hi. Tai. Tai, okay. Um, <laughs> In, uh, instead of um, you hear just 
rayon or more likely daira, um, which is the very pure Arabic term, uh, but it is uh, a little more flexible as to what it denotes both temporally and spatially. So that's one aspect. The other is um, on a kind of ideological erasure. So getting, getting rid of the whole ideology that comes with names. So not just place names, but personal names and titles. Um, so the Chinese titles are systematically be, being replaced with what? With Russian terms. So we see in the 20s when Turkish had its cleansing of Perso-Arabic terms, these were typically replaced by either constructed Turkic terms or in some cases European, but more likely constructed Turkic. But in the Uyghur case, we see that typically they're replaced by Russian and English terms. So instead of, we, we get, we might expect Karimok Bashlik, but instead we get President Karimok. Um, now, now here's where your eyes may glaze over, but um, I did some measures of linguistic complexity um, to compare these three broadcasts, which is the more complicated, okay? Um, I'm just gonna skip what all these details of what linguistic complexity is. But my, my hypothesis was the more complicated it is, the higher prestige it would be. Okay, less complicated, low prestige. So that would that would show us the two varieties of weight work. And my hypothesis was further that that uh, diasporic weight work, that is RFA weight work, would be more complicated. So I compared lexical density. So how many unique words per thousand words were used? Sentence length, how long a sentence was, and syntactic complexity, which I'll talk about in a minute. Before we talk about this, what do speakers think? Okay, so part of this is uh, a cold, hard linguistic measure, but part of this is an emotional thing. Ideology is all about subjective perception. So, well, the few people that I have been able to talk with about Chinese radio, so Chinese national radio and Urumqi radio, say, well, those broadcasts, the content is not very relevant to us. It seems not very interesting. And they also say it seems like translation from Chinese. About RFA, some, at least some listeners, they tend to talk more about style than the content. And they say, they're trying to sound so intellectual. <laughs> so, and then of course I have my own biases my guess would be that Urumqi radio would be the least complex, that Chinese national radio would be complete translatees, so it would be just Chinese rendered into Uyghur without any effort to make it into real Uyghur grammar, and RFA would be the most complex language. Um, I was not right, okay, I was wrong. Lexical density, never mind the types versus tokens. The, main, the interesting thing is Xinjiang radio had the highest lexical density. So 683.5 unique words out of 1,000. That was a total surprise. Uh, RFA hobbled along behind at 534 unique words, and China National Radio 505 unique words out of 1,000. Now, this was a little more complicated analysis, so I only did it on six texts, two from each. So if I did it on hundreds, um, it might be different. Secondly, vocabulary. Um, this is expected. The use of Chinese and non-Chinese was in complete complementary distribution, whereby Chinese national radio had lots of Chinese, RFA had zero. So they were, RFA is, has been very good at eliminating Chinese. So, um, in RFA, the most frequent terms of all of the broadcasts that sampled were Khtai at 85 items, Uyghur at 50 items, and some variety of America, America Look, etc. at um, however many items. Uh, I didn't say. Okay. Um, RFA had zero uses of Zhongguo and zero uses of optonome. Very interesting. 
Uh, RFA indeed was the champion for sentence length, 25.27 words per sentence, average of the mean. Um, Chinese National Radio, 21, so a little bit less. But the sentence length, I found, had a lot to do with the genre, so when it's a formal broadcast talking about um, formal political social topics, it uh, tends to be long sentences. When it's an interview on cultural topics, then the sentences tend to be short. So this is not a great measure. Syntactic complexity, this is the probably the more controversial of my techniques, and I'm open to feedback, but my hypothesis is that when uh, sentences are embedded inside other sentences, then that is more complex than simply taking phrases and joining them on like beads on a necklace. And my hypothesis was that sentences inside sentences uh, would be more frequent in RFA Uyghur than Chinese um, broadcast Uyghur. And so a sentence inside sentence is something like, the man whom I knew was wearing a hat. So it has, whom I knew is a sentence inside of the other one. Um, okay, never mind, don't. This is just an example, but this is an RFA sentence that has been severely edited because it's too long. But if you look at the, the graphical representation, each, each node, each dangly complex on a tree is an embedded sentence. And so we see, in fact, there's a couple of embedded sentences in each of these three nodes. And each of these are collected, connected by gan, ran, ran, luk, gan, luk, these type of phrases. And so you can see them bolded here. I'm not going to read them all, but you can see uh, six examples of gan, ran, ikan, lilani, bol, ran, bildur, ran, etc. Ending finally with a finite verb. Okay? Um, so this roughly translates as two government officers who were sent to Karamai to send back the parents who had come to Beijing to complain. Let the Beijing Public Security know that the movements of these parents who had come from da 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 da, and it went on and on and on. So that's one sentence. Contrast Chinese national radio, and these are very typical, typical utterances. We have beads on a string, a chain. So this is also a Uyghur language, but they're connected by ish phrases. So we have, you know, yeza evilik, blah 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 blah, sirka yuzlanishi, and then blah blah blah, ah 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 tip kabliship, zoraitish, zoraitish, kenge tishka, da 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 da. So this year, the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region's agricultural enterprises were orienting themselves towards exports, participating actively in blah blah blah, expanding blah blah blah, enlarging. Along, along, creating da, 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 da. So you see, long sentence, but it's a parallel construction, not an embedding construction. All right, so to summarize what I found, uh, the vocabulary comparing these three varieties of Uyghur, RFA is, has been very consistent in removing all Chinese from the Uyghur language that it uses. Chinese National Radio and Urumqi Radio reflect the mixed state of formal Uyghur, where you have some Chinese, particularly in administrative and uh, titles, administrative terms and titles, but the density, that is the vocabulary density, and uh, it depends very much on the type of broadcast it is, the genre. The sentence length, RFA, has the longest sentences, but as I said, the um, this is also very much dependent on genre with interviews being shorter. And uh, with grammatical com complexity, I would argue that uh, RFA broadcasts use extensive embedding, and whereas Chinese National Radio and the Rumshi Radio do not, do not. So it's less syntactically complex. And in fact, this ish construction um, may well represent syntactic influence from Chinese. Okay. What I infer about speakers, um, how much speakers have accepted this new diasporic Uyghur, we, we don't know yet. This is, this is very new. This is language change happening. But 
we can see probably that we RFA vocabulary choices have influenced we, or, um, this new linguistic consciousness that I talked about that emerged independently in Chinese Turkestan. Um, but the RFA changes in syntax, these apply only to formal language that is basically only written language, so you don't see them in spoken language, you don't speak people embedding their sentences. Um, but what's really interesting is this independent development in uh, Chinese Turkestan, where people are attempting to make their language more orderly, also by removing some of the Chinese terms and also by code switching left, less. So what we've seen then is a rise of a new kind of Uyghur, which I'm calling desinicized Uyghur. Um, this is a, both an individual response in Chinese Turkestan and an organizational response by RFA in a conscious opposition to a sinicized Uyghur. And uh, it is under debate, not open debate, but it's under subconscious debate, which is the high variety. People have ambivalence and allegiance to both. So, um, and this is because of ideas of purity of language. Uh, Uyghur language purity is somehow maintained in this diasporic Uyghur, even though a lot of Russian and English has been introduced just as long as it has no Chinese. So basically what we're saying is purified Uyghur has taken one colonizer language and replaced two other colonizer languages that are less historically relevant right now, Russian and English. And so what we're seeing is Uyghur is being ideologically cleansed. Whether it's actually linguistically cleansed is an open question. Thank you.